Good afternoon. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by journalist Marvin Kalb. Today we present our 101st program in this, our 26th season on the air. This is also our first virtual program in the series. We are proud to welcome as our guest Emmy Award winning documentarian Ken Burns who has illuminated American life through films including the Civil War, Jazz, the Statue of Liberty, the Vietnam War, country music, and baseball. Over the course of his career, he has provided context and perspective on many of the cultural, political, and racial challenges we face today. We appreciate this opportunity to step back with him and consider our path forward with history as our guide. We thank those who have made this program possible, beginning with Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation, which for 17 consecutive years has underwritten our CALB Report series. The partnership that produces the CALB Report includes the National Press Club Journalism Institute, University of Maryland Global Campus, the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs, Harvard's Shorenstein Center, the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and the Gaylord College of Journalism at the University of Oklahoma. We thank our presenting station, Maryland Public Television, for its commitment to our series, American Public Television for our national distribution, and both Sirius XM Satellite Radio and Federal News Radio in Washington for our audio broadcasts. We want to thank our student volunteers for this program from the Gaylord College of Journalism and our Cal Report staff, including Tina Creek, Scott Graham, Melanie Ayarde, and the broadcast team here at the National Press Club. Our producers, Lindsay Underwood, Bob Ludwig, Brian Kane, Dick Golden, Kat Bug, and Avi Feinberg, and our senior producer, Heather Date. Once again, our sincere thanks to Ken Burns and to our moderator, my friend and colleague of 26 years, the last person personally hired at CBS News by Edward R. Murrow, Marvin Kalb. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the program, which will begin momentarily. The Kalb Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Kalb Report, a special virtual edition, and it's caused, as you can imagine, by the pandemic. I'm Marvin Kalb and I'm at home here in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and my guest is the legendary documentarian Ken Burns, who's in his office in New Hampshire. For more than 40 years, Ken Burns has been producing award-winning documentaries from the Brooklyn Bridge to country music, from baseball to the Civil War. He is, in my judgment, one of those few best equipped to define and to explain this difficult, dangerous moment in American history. We have a pandemic, we have severe economic dislocation, and an urgent mass movement against racial inequality. Ken Burns, welcome back to the Calv Report. Your last visit was in 2006. That was five years after 9-11. And I asked you at that time why you had not done a documentary on 9-11. And you answered more or less that you needed 25 years of perspective in order to get it right. Well, I don't have 25 <laughs> years. And I'd like also to remind you um, that in 2016, you said at a, um, at a university, quote, there comes a time when I and you can no longer remain neutral, silent. We must speak up and speak out. So, good sir, let's both speak up and speak out. Uh, if you were doing a documentary right now on the year 2020, how would you come up with the theme that you would focus on and the elements behind that theme. Well, first of all, Marvin, let me just say how honored I am to be with you again. I am 
such an extraordinary admirer and I always enjoy the conversations we've had. This is the fundamental question. It's funny that the last time we were together <laughs> formally doing this was at the fifth anniversary of 9-11. And at that point, I think we felt that 9-11 would be uh, one of those watershed events. And of course it is. Uh, but I think what's happened to us in 2020 is far overshadows the significance of that event. I think that the COVID pandemic uh, takes its place with the three other great crises in American history, the Civil War, uh, the Great Depression, and the Second World War. And that in many ways, I think we have to understand that the overlay or perhaps the underlay of the other issues that we're dealing with now, obvi the obvious economic pain, but also the, um, the, the painful reckoning with our racial uh, past and our failures to address this in any meaningful way o over time. The loss of some of our great leaders just in the last uh, few days has um, really set this in stark relief. I, I think we just begin with the idea of, of, of a pandemic, of a pestilence that is in the air and begin to see that there are similarities between all of them. We've, we've, we've hit a kind of wall in which our formidable and extraordinary democracy has been sort of shook to its knees, brought to its knees by uh, an absence of leadership <laughs> from the top, uh, by this inability for us to respond in any way like any of the other uh, developed nations uh, to have a unified uh, federal response to this disease. And so we find ourselves in a hell uh, on earth of our own making. And overlaying all of that is, of course, uh, the murder of, of George Floyd and the way that it has um, reopened in a way that is spectacular and unpredictable our, our, our reckoning with this racial past. Let's just say it. Uh, we know exactly when we were founded, July 4th, 1776. We know where Philadelphia and we know the words that we abide by the second sentence of the declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I'm not even halfway through the sentence, but I have to stop and tell you that the author of that sentence owned more than a hundred human beings and never saw the contradiction, never saw the hypocrisy, and more importantly, never saw fit in his lifetime to free any one of those people. And so here we are struggling as a country that <laughs> believes in its guts and its own exceptionalism and, and finds ourselves unable to even cross the simplest of T's or dot the simplest of I's. And I think we're in a big mess right now. And it is, I think we have to acknowledge it. It's terrifying. It is changed, it is rearranged all of our molecules. Uh, all of the things that we took for granted are, are no longer there. Uh, I can see it in the eyes of my children and my grandchildren, uh, both adult children and, and, and young children that I still have at home. I, I feel it in my dreams. I see it on the faces of, of other people. And yet, I have to say that I think this reckoning has the possibility, at least, of delivering us on the other side, whenever that may be, and please may it be sooner rather than later. The possibility of, of really perhaps escaping the specific gravity, not only of this pestilence, um, but also of the thing, the original sin, as historians like to call it, uh, the sin of, sin of slavery that have, have chained us to our past that have kept us down for too long, where we still continue, and it's clear from the highest office in the land to you know anywhere in the country that we still continue to judge people not by the content of their character, as Dr. King said, but by the color of their skin. Uh, Ken, when you do a documentary and they focus on American history, what are the guideposts as you look into American history that you try to recapture when you're doing a documentary, say on, on 2020 or the Civil War itself, what are the guideposts? What are the essential features of American life that you look for? 
Well, I think, you know, we, we like to say that history repeats itself. It doesn't. It never has. Tell me one time when it's repeated itself. We like <laughs> to say we're condemned to repeat what we don't remember. It's a lovely <laughs> phrase. It's, it's been given life over the last 75 years by the horror of the Holocaust, but that's not true either. Um, Ecclesiastes, that's the Old Testament, said what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun, which seems to suggest that human nature doesn't change. That, that sounds pessimistic and it could be, um, but we do have qualities of, of generosity along with the qualities of greed uh, in all of us and between us. And so I think Mark Twain is supposed to have said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so I am first and foremost a filmmaker. Um, I am interested in telling stories. And fortunately, I work in American history the way some painter might work in oil paints as opposed to watercolors. And fortunately, American history is mostly made up of the word story and then hi, uh, which is a good <laughs> way to begin. I notice the rhymes. I'm, I'm not interested in connecting the dots when I'm making the films to the present because that would render it more political or more of a, of a dialectic. But I do know that every time I've finished a film for as long as I've been making films, you lift up and you go, boy, it's just like today. And, and that tells you a little bit about the truth of Twain. It rhymes. And the two most important rhymes in American history have to do with freedom, of course, the nature of it, the way we advertise it, the falseness of it, the, that is to say the lie of it, and also this internal tension between what I'll say is a collective freedom, what we need, and a personal freedom, what I want. And, and to give you the clearest example, it's already in your head, Marvin, already, which is, I don't want to wear a mask. Nobody to, can tell me what I'm doing. I'm a free American. Don't do that. And of course, you idiot, a mask is what's going to save not only your life, but your parents' lives and your children's lives and your neighbors' lives and all the rest of ours. And if we had done that months ago, we'd be all right. And that's the collective freedom. And the other is, of course, race, because we were born under this sign that we have proudly proclaimed to the world. Um, and yet we have failed abysmally in it. And it's tough for two white guys, you and me, to actually talk about it without with any reasonable degree of authority. But let me connect for a second the two pandemics, the ongoing pandemic present since 1619, when Africans were forcibly brought to this shore, um, and, and the current pandemic. And that is to say that you and I haven't ever worried about going to the convenience store until now. You and I have not worried about what it's like to go out jogging or walking in a park until now. And this has been the normal state for African Americans for as long as they have been in our country. And something happened when George Floyd was murdered. It will dissipate a little bit, but I am stunned at the tenacity of this where people are just saying, enough, we cannot continue to live this lie of the American dream. Uh, and you know, the, one of the last comments of our Civil War series, which is now 30 years old, was the historian Barbara Field saying, you know, that the Civil War is still being fought and regrettably, it can still be lost. And so like, we, we find these questions ever present in our life. And yet none of us, you know, my friend, Chris Rock, the, the comedian, speaks to mostly white college audiences at times. And he said, look, I'm a multimillionaire, but you'd never change places with me for a second. And absolutely. Where, where, why? You know, why don't we investigate that? Why aren't we willing to dive deep? And I think maybe because everything's been stripped away by the sheer terror of this pandemic, that the leadership has failed so utterly that we're in a position not just to perceive and articulate our suffering, but also to wreck ourselves to a higher place. Well, one of the questions that jumps into my mind right now when you say where do you place the blame? Do you place the blame on the political leadership? You've, you've talked about President Trump. Um, what do you place the blame on the political institutions themselves? In other words, are we at a point when we can ask a question such as uh, Gaylord College student Brianna Mitchell asks about the mass, which you 
talked about Ken just a moment ago, she was wondering, what does it say about the nature of our country today, about the nature of our political system? If the question of wearing a mask becomes an issue of political division, rather than something that is so simple, it's for everybody to do to help everybody. Have we lost the capacity to think of ourselves as a unit? Are we all just broken down into warring segments? Yeah, that's 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 the question. You know, Marvin, I, I've I've I like to say that I've made I've been working for more than forty years telling stories about the U.S., but I've also been telling stories about us. That is to say, the two-letter lowercase plural pronoun. <laughs> and and I've had the great privilege all of my professional life of occupying a space <laughs> between us and also we and our, the warmth and intimacy of those words, and the majesty and the complexity and the controversy and the contradiction of the US. And that's a, been a great place to mine it. And I do think that while it is darkest before dawn, that we've really lost our way in that regard. Somewhere along the line, and it's been true in periods of American history, people understood that division paid that it pays to sort of point out. My, my feeling is that I've learned in 40 years that there's only us, there's no them, there's no them. And whenever anyone tells you there, there's a them, run far away. So in many ways, there's an implicit dialectic in your question about blame. We're all to blame, you're to blame, Marvin, I'm to blame. We failed ourselves. And so it, it's facile for me to you know, get up four years ago in a, in a commencement address at Stanford University and without naming names, talk about the presumptive Republican nominee uh, and warning, and everything I've said has come true and worse, worse than what I said. Um, but really, it begins here with me. It begins here with everyone. And um, we but can, can, excuse me, can we put Humpty Dumpty back together again? Can we get back to where we were? So many people are talking about an inflection point, that we have reached a pivot. And when we go from here on out, it's going to be significantly different from where we were as a nation. Do you accept that? Do you feel you twice now in the last couple of minutes have talked about coming to the edge, but are we over the edge in your judgment or are we still on this side of it with an ample opportunity to take care of the problem? So you ask, is this experiment of the United States redeemable? In a sense, yes. I believe and, and, and Congressman, the late Congressman John Lewis was the one who kept on speaking about the redeeming of the soul of America. This is and what you I have talked yourself about finding our better angels. And yeah. I'm simply raising a question. It's yeah. not what I believe. I'm raising a question. Are we there? Can we find our better angels? We're um, not there. Is, we're not there, but we can find those better angels. I, I have to believe that, Marvin, and so do you, and so does everyone else. We understand the ways in which it is easier to devolve into these kind of tribal mentalities and modalities, but you know, it's not going to work. This virus does not care. And we've got a reckoning. That's what it is. I, I, I had the great privilege of knowing John Lewis uh, for most of the last 30 years. Uh, we're in a kind of grief right now as a country when we realize, um, and, and again, this is another parallel uh, between the, the two viruses, the two pandemics, you know? John Lewis, like our, like our nurses, like our doctors, like our first responders ran toward the problem. He ran toward the problem, knowing from experience that his head was going to get beaten in, that he was going to be bruised and battered and maybe killed and certainly put in jail. And he ran towards the problem. And so I think that, that within us, 
are the seeds of our disunion and always have been. Lincoln predicted this as a young lawyer uh, back in 1837 or 38. He said, uh, when shall we expect the approach of danger? Shall some transatlantic giants step the earth and crush us at a blow? Then he answered his own questions. Never, all the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or make a track in the Blue Ridge in the trial of a thousand years. If destruction <laughs> be our lot, we must ourselves be the author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live through all time or die by suicide. The, the question of that suicide, which you ask, which is exactly, Marvin, the question is ever present with us. We just seem to be farther away. I remember in our Vietnam series, we talked to an extraordinary Marine who came back and could not could not lock away the things. And he said, I was dating my 45 then. I mean, wow. just a terrifying image. He put his hand up like this. He said, I was dating my 45. And one day he had the round chamber and this was the day he was gonna do it. And then the dog scratched at the door and he went to let the dog in. And he realized if I could care about the dog, I could live another day. And so all we need to do, <laughs> it's not that far. We think this, we have to go a long way in order for, meaningful things to happen. And it's true, you know, when we spoke about 9-11, we were also lamenting the fact that the sense of national cohesion, we are all New Yorkers, had evaporated, that we had not been asked to do anything. If our leaders had given us a list of seven things to do, we would have done them and nothing was asked of us except to go shopping. And so we were <laughs> disappointed at the dissipation of the of the comedy that had been brought, the, the togetherness that had been wrought by the, by the murder of 3,000 citizens across the World Trade Center and a field in Pennsylvania. But you know, Ken, Ken, I have a sense that a lot of people feel we have lost it. I, in other words, that we can believe we're close and we can believe that these principles are absolutely rock solid. But there are a lot of people today, I talk to them, I read them, I hear them, who believe we're past that point, that something large and dramatic and fundamental is happening to us now. And that we may not get up in the morning and look out at the same tree, it may be gone. Yeah. And are we prepared for that as a people? Or, or is that sort of a European idea and not an optimistic idea, which is always soaked uh, in America and in the optimism of the American spirit? Oh, yeah. I, it was funny that you said that. I'm working on a film right now of the several that we have going on the United States and the Holocaust, what we knew and when we knew it, what we did and what we didn't do, what we should have done. Yes. Of course, there is the European experience of one day there was this and then that that was no longer there. Uh, you had a comfortable upper middle class life. You were integrated, fully assimilated. You were a loyal German citizen. You just unfortunately in that circumstance happened to be Jewish and everything changed. And if there were three of you in your family, you could odds on expect two of you to be dead within the next few years. Yes. Um, this is, of course, what Lincoln was talking about, understanding that the two great oceans, the Atlantic and the Pacific, formed a kind of buffer for us from the kinds of transformative things that still, would normally still. do. But when viruses cross the sea in an airplane, uh, when you have the failure of leadership, the misinterpretation of the very bedrock principles that you're talking about, then we are clearly in an existential moment. But I do not share the pessimism that it's done. I mean, I have... I have young daughters and I spoke the other day in a Zoom much like this to a young American environmental activist, uh, the sort of American equivalent, uh, Greta Thunberg. And they just, both of them, my 15 year old daughter and, and, and this young woman felt that 
you know, we're, we're just not who we believe we are. They, they see us way down the list, kind of the way our, our math test scores are, not the greatest country on earth. And, and everything that's going on is, is proof of that uh, to them, but they've never felt it in their lives. They haven't, they haven't an ever imbibed at even the possibility of exceptionalism. They say, look, we're born with slavery. This is crazy. You can't escape that, and and this is will be our undoing. Or we have this acquisitive nature in which it's you know, judge me quarter to quarter, and the environment be damned, and global warming is is there like a gigantic shadow, uh, crushing us now, uh, even as we are distracted in this moment by a pandemic. So there there are those you know, doomsayers, and I understand exactly where they're coming from. But I can't subscribe to it. I no, no, I understand. I do think the better <laughs> angels are there, Marvin. <clears throat> Ken, let's hope that the better angels are there. I certainly hope so. What I'm curious about, if we stay within the context of the American experience as being exceptional and so solid that even these terrible climate, these terrible forces working against it will not be able to shake it. Okay, let's, let's hold that for a sec. Then there are other illustrations in American history. Um, I remember covering the great period of 1968. In that period of time, great leaders were shot. There was economic problems. There was the Vietnam War. And people did believe that we had come to, to an inflection point, freaking me for using that expression again. Um, I didn't believe it then. I believed it was just a troubled time. I hope my reporting was clean. I think it was. But as I look back upon it now, it did not contain the elements of today, starting with the epidemic and moving on into our politics as well. I keep on wondering about the comparison to 68 and whether in your mind, it has validity or not? Well, it's wonderful. And I can reassure you as someone who watched that you were fair. I do think what you're talking about is a sense that you were backed up by certain institutions that were inviolate, regardless of what happened. No matter how many bombs went off, no matter how many body bags came back, no matter how many <laughs> leaders were assassinated, even the most venal among us, of our politicians still adhered to a kind of set of rules. And there is a sense, a palpable yes. sense, that the playbook has been thrown out and it's anything goes. I mean, just, yes. you know, just taking the emoluments clause alone. And that's a boring snoozer for most people. <laughs> uh, that just still shocks me to this day. And yet I also, and I, and I read the same people I think that you read who sort of feel that this is, uh, at an end, that the reckoning that I'm talking about is is a kind of um, has a disastrous ending. Um, I, I still don't feel it. I, I think using '68 because history has never repeated itself, right? It just rhymes. We can appreciate the rhymes to 1968, but let's go back to 1862, right, or 1863, and go. Right. Okay, now. The Union Army has just lost again at Chancellorsville, right? They're invading the North again. It's all over. It's all over. And, um, you know, we, we have not reached the death toll uh, of the pandemic of 1918 when stuff didn't stop. I mean, the people in one city who decided to keep their parade on suffered greater casualties than the people who did not have the parade and decided not to do that. But we're, we're, we're at a place where that doesn't. We have examples from the 18th and the 19th century where an entire town would be wiped out or a Native American village would be visited by a French or English or American trader. And all of a sudden, 95% are, are, were gone. <laughs> Um, we, we, we do have this, we shield it, the, the sanitized Madison Avenue view of our past is not, um, 
capable of dealing with what's going on. I mean, even Lincoln in his um, address to Congress, what we'd call the State of the Union in 1862, December of 1862, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is we must act anew, we must think anew, we must (laughs) disenthrall ourselves. Interesting turn of phrase, disenthrall, stop being a slave to these things. And so when you ask a question as nuanced and fine as that, Marvin, you're just saying, will we ever be free of the chains of these new sort of tropes of of government conspiracies, of deep states, of disrespect of institutions, of a kind of narcissistic acquisitiveness that makes it impossible for us to recognize normal democratic procedures? And, <laughs> and I, I obviously, I'm an amateur historian at best. I'm a filmmaker. I don't think so. I have no way to prove it. But I also know that I am complicit with what's wrong, as are you, as I went going back to my earlier thing. And we're just <laughs> obligated to not spend a lot of time talking about it. We need to do a lot more listening, particularly okay. for people of color. And we need to do things together. We have to find a new kind of civics out of this greatest of all threats to the to the republic right now. We, you know, the institutions are under the greatest assault. Ken, I want to get into that point. I just want to take a moment now, forgive me, to remind our viewers and listeners that this is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and my guest is the filmmaker. I call him the great historian, Ken Burns, and we're discussing the whole history of the United States. And Ken, in your great documentaries, you've spent an enormous amount of time on the issue of race. And in our conversation so far, it has come up time and time again. And I don't want to put you on the spot unnecessarily. In my own lifetime, I have seen countless illustrations of racial injustice. And I ask myself, is this going to be forever? And I look around and it does continue. And one can be an optimist and say, hey, wait a minute, Guy. Uh, We recently elected a black person to be the president of the United States. And we elected him twice. And that's fantastic progress. And yet there's a pessimistic side of me, I guess, that says that may not be enough. Uh, well, and that you know, isn't enough. And I'd like to bring you in and get your thinking since you spent so much time on this issue. Are we capable as a people, as a nation, of rising above racial discrimination, injustice, in so many different horrible forms, and find some arc bending inevitably, as they say, toward justice and a kind of biblical goodness. Dr. King was right about that arc, and our friend John Lewis was right about that. And so while we can contemplate our navels and get all worried and chicken little on ourselves, um, (laughs) we don't have the luxury of that. We just don't. We just have to say, yes, we can make it better. We can make it better. I mean, I've done race. I, I, you know, I've done 35, 36 films. Some of them are an hour in length. Some of them are 18 and a half hours in length. And I I can count on the fingers of one hand, the number of films that don't deal with race just directly. And people have given me all sorts of grief all throughout my professional life. You know, uh, you know, please, it's not about that. We're colorblind. We're this, uh, that. And I, I would just shake my, sorry, e- academics even, enough, critics, friends, you know, when are you going to stop? And when, when Barack Obama was elected, um, inaugurated, they said, now will you stop? Like, please, Ken, stop. You just don't do this. And I held up the, the, the Onion magazine, the satirical magazine, whose January... 20th, uh, 2009 cover said, black man given worst job in nation. And (laughs) I just said, just wait and just watch what happens. These are the age old human forces. They, they, They are between us and within us. And this is a big battle. Uh, and it is a battle that it is possible to despair. Um, and yet, 
we don't have any choice. We, we have to go for it. We have to preserve this union. We have to restore the things that have lost. We have to make repairs. And that's what happens. Hurricanes come through and you, and, and you, and you rebuild again. You're sort of saying, does this mean like the hurricane just came through and we don't exist anymore? I don't know if that's going to be the case, but I don't accept that right now. And so I'm trying with every fiber of my being in the best way I know how <laughs> just to tell stories and to talk and to try to galvanize a sense of memory, kind of muscle memory of who we are and, and what we're about. And if that means doing something on um, Benjamin Franklin and the American Revolution as we are, of holding our feet to the fire of our failures um, in the years leading up to the Holocaust and, and beyond. I mean, the Germans were impressed by our extermination of the Native Americans and by our Jim Crow laws. They, they helped, they studied our Jim Crow laws to put in the exclusionary laws about Jews. And then they stick, stuck around and studied our eugenics and then horrifically perfected it. We, we, we don't have a lot of glory there. And at the same time, you know, we just passed the 75th anniversary of D-Day. There were farm kids who landed off the coast of France. They had no interest in conquest. They were not going to be materially rewarded for the territory that they were going to take back. They just did it for some idea. And I still believe in that idea. And I think an overwhelming majority of Americans did. Now, when you were reporting in 1968, there were three networks, barely three networks. <laughs> there, were, um, there was public broadcasting, educational stuff. And there were newspapers and news services so that when, wherever you were, if you picked up a paper or turned on the nightly news, everybody got more or less the same thing. Now that doesn't happen. And no. so we're obligated more than ever to try to realize and accept without disappointment that a lie goes around the world a few times before the truth can get started, but that the truth will out, that that arc will bend towards justice, that history is a rising road, that John Lewis yes. was right to move towards the storm, to move. God, I hope you are right. But God, just I hope look you who's are doing right. it. Look at the nurses. Could there be a more exalted, no, no, I, I understand. exalted I understand. job than a nurse right now? No, I understand. And I absolutely agree with you. And I want you to be right. Please understand that. I want you to be right. I'm simply stuck in my constant quest for evidence. Yeah. And I feel as if I don't have enough at the moment. And I'm looking for that evidence. And I don't want to base large conclusions on faith. I want to base it on fact. Yeah. Okay. And so, for example, so for example, Ken, just a sec. Um, I, I want to get this question because a Gaylord College student, another one, Sophia Olivas, has told me that you have spoken a great deal in favor of the removal of Confederate statues yes. all over the country. Now. That's a rough subject right now. It's a political subject, as everything is political, it seems. But what do you say when she asks, um, what do you say to those who claim that we need those statues to remember our history? I think it's a legitimate question. Oh, it's a beautiful question. So let me question. throw it at you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Um, and I didn't mean to interrupt. I just think that I can give you lots of examples of positivity uh, that that will help offset the the sort of despair that may be creeping within. But the 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 Confederate things are 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 just a no brainer. None of them were erected while the Civil War was going on or when it ended. They all came in the late um, in the 1880s and 90s when white supremacy was being brutally reimposed over the South after the collapse of Reconstruction. Reconstruction is always taught to us as a bad period. It was a good period. It was a period of civil rights um, and equality within the South. And when that collapsed and a backroom deal of Florida electors, you can't make this up. I won't go into great detail, but you, but you can certainly look it up. Samuel Tilden won the popular vote, but Rutherford B. Hayes 
became the president because Democratic electors switched to to vote for the Republican. The quid pro quo is, will the federal troops leave the South? And if they did, then Reconstruction was over. So those statues <laughs> went up at that time. The Dixie, the Confederate flag, which is not the Confederate flag, the flag of the Confederate States of America, never recognized by our government, never recognized by Abraham Lincoln. You go to the Library of Congress, the official title is the War of the Rebellion. These are men, generals responsible for more loyal American deaths than Hitler or Tojo. And then all these statues went up and one battle flag, one battle flag of one of the Southern armies, the Army of Northern Virginia, went into a kind of popular use by the Ku Klux Klan. That's the Confederate flag that we call the Confederate flag. And it worked its way into almost every one of this, the flags of the old Confederacy. And most of that went in after 1954. What happened in 1954? Brown versus Board of Education. So this is reactive white supremacy. There's, I have no doubt in my mind, you have to change the names of those forts and bases. You have to take down those statues to people who are traitors to America that are responsible for loyal American deaths. And, and, and you can leave them up at, at the, um, in the battlefields and you can interpret them and you don't have to melt them down. You can put them in museums. And then you need to say the more important stuff is you need to go to Thomas Jefferson's memorial and you need to interpret it in a different way. They've done it now at Monticello. You need to go to Mount Vernon, which has never lied about being a plantation. God bless George Washington for that. And you need to go to various steps and say, look, we need to have a bigger history. This is not getting rid of anybody's history, as the president said. This is not limiting it. This is enlarging the history and interpretation is part of it. So I understand the impulse of the question, but there's no need to have a statue of um, Jeb Stewart up in in a county courthouse square or on a campus or or something like that. They need to go and and now even Mississippi, the first of the states to put the Confederate flag into its flag, the last to take it out is going to take it out. And and that tells me that's in my list of good stuff. Mark. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's it's right. the nurses, it's the delivery <laughs> people, it's the people who don't get bubkist out of this American dream who are doing the hardest work for us. The people who go shopping for us, who deliver things to us, who will take care of us if we happen to fall sick. The, this, this tells you about the possibility of what's in the human soul and the human breast and politics becomes such a superficial dialectic binary thing. Red state, blue state, gay, straight, young, old, white, Black, North, South, East, West, rich, poor. I mean, none of that matters at the end of the day when you look at your child or if you see a sunset, what Emily Dickinson called the far theatricals of day. If you're sick and need a doctor, they're not asking you, who did you vote for in the last election? Right? And I mean, that is... That's still there. That's still there. But those statues, gone. Uh, Ken Burns, uh, that was very well said. Thank you. Um, you talked a moment ago about <clears throat> American journalism. And I'd like to ask you to describe just for a moment your view of the state of American journalism today. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's as good <clears throat> as it's ever been, Marvin. I, I think that the kind of work that's being done at the three great papers uh, in our country, and I don't mean to insult others that are you know, almost as great as the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. The work that's going on there must remind you of the kind of groundbreaking work that took place in Watergate. The problem is, is as I suggested, the proliferation of where we get our information is so atomized that we don't have that ability to sort of feel like we're getting the same things. There are people who actually have never heard the president say you can cure this by ingesting bleach of some kind. They believe that he was tricked into saying that by the media and no example is being shown. We don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So it's really tough if you don't get to read the Gettysburg Address after the battle, <laughs> after the dedication of the cemetery, 
to do that. I mean, the Chicago Times said uh, at the time, and let's just, the press is the press is the press. They said the cheek of every American must tingle with shame as they read the silly, flat, dishwatery utterances of the man who has to be pointed out to intelligent foreigners as the president of the United States. <laughs> this is in reference to a two minute speech that we almost universally agree, left, right, and center is the greatest speech in the English language in politics, the Gettysburg Address. You know, and Edward Everett, who was the speaker beforehand, wrote to the president and said, you know, I, I feel that you got closer to the heart of the matter in two minutes than I did in two hours. So mm -hmm. that's it's always been this stuff. I got a quote from baseball. If you want something free of politics, a guy, his name is Pete O'Brien. He said, you know, they don't play baseball the way they used to. I don't mean they don't play it with the same rules. They just don't play it with the same spirit. That was written in 1858 wow. for the professional game. There's always going to be that stuff. The question is, and what I tell people all the time, I've got a Twitter account, but I don't use it. I have someone who says, John Lewis died. Do you wish to say something? And I go, yes, right? And so I write something, right? That's it. I have no Facebook. I get my news, I insist to people, if you wanna stop, you wanna save your country, go back and read at least two of those three newspapers I mentioned every day, cover to cover. That's it, not just the, the, the headlines about this, but the one, the headline that says, worthwhile Canadian initiative, which Kay Graham once told me was the headline destined <laughs> that the article would never be read, read that. Look at the nightly news on whatever of the three or four networks, including PBS, the news hour. Just watch that. Just watch it. Because what you have are, are the, not the echo, not the residual, but the, but the manifestation of the journalistic code right there. Now, if, you, if you're a political junkie and you need to watch Fox and you need to watch MSNBC or, that, or CNN or whatever it might be, that's fine too. But just get the facts, man. And then all of a sudden, you'll find the difference between the guy who is diametrically opposed to you politically and what you believe begins to shrink. And in that shrinkage is the possibility for the communication and the possibility of the reasonable compromises that are at the heart of our democracy that have fled because if you can manipulate the media to your point of view and your people only hear what they wanna hear, why would you care about the truth? Why would you but say? But then the, the question yeah. that you're suggesting there, Ken, if I understood you right, is that American democracy itself is threatened by some of the large undercurrents in the press right now. And the gut feeling that I have is that you at least have to raise a question in your mind about whether American democracy can survive unless... Yeah unless it has a strong, virile, unafraid press. Yeah. We well, have to be able to talk truth to power. That press is there, Marvin, it's there. The problem is all the other stuff that we're including and lumping into the news, which isn't the news. Facebook isn't the news. Right. Twitter isn't the news. It's absurd to think of that. And the fact that there's no governors on their engine. I mean, at least we've seen some modest attempts by Twitter to sort of rein in the plague that they've also created. But at Facebook, they're like they're just going ka-ching. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no. We This is a this is a free speech issue. The way yelling fire in a crowded theater falsely is a free speech issue and you can't do it. And that's, I, I think there's too many fires being called out that don't exist. And of course they end up creating uh, the fires that may burn down what you're talking about, but I'm, I'm not yet gotten to that place where I'm wringing my hands and saying, that's it. Where's that Canadian, you know, hideout or the moving to New Zealand is. is no, Ken, I, I understand where you're going with that. Uh, but I, I wonder, whether it's possible now to divide a sort of ideal image of the press and what it should be doing and its role in American democracy. We're on the same page there. My concern is that the press appears to be involved itself in the political warfare of our time. Yes. And many Americans don't know the difference between 
um, an argument on MSNBC or Fox and the front page of the New York Times, they tend to say it's all the press right. and as a bad thing. And the president himself speaks of the press as an enemy of the people and any kind of anti-Trump criticism as fake news, anti any kind of poll that suggests the president is losing political support as a fake poll. And the loss of the distinction between a clean functioning press with an honest impulse. I'm not saying that every journalist is great. I'm not saying every newspaper is great. I'm saying there is an impulse, as you were talking before about our democracy. There are certain fundamentals in American journalism that must go on to preserve the democracy. And those are jeopardized in a sense by these outliers on the side, the peripherals might become the center. A uh, president uh, has a Twitter account of more than 80 million followers. That doesn't mean they agree with him, but people who read him, 80 million constitutes a large political force. And can we keep the press out of politics is what I'm getting at, I guess. I, is yeah. there a way of, of keeping the press clean? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that for the entire history of our republic, the press has not been clean. There have been <laughs> times, you know, I mean, and, and it was okay. I mean, you knew that this city's paper was a Democrat paper and you knew that this city's paper was a Republican thing or that this was, you know, pro-business or anti-labor or what, whatever it was. There was that tact all along. What we have, though, is the uncontrolled, where the tail, the technological tail is wagging the dog. Exactly. So, That's what I was trying to get at a moment ago. Thank you. So, so what we require is a kind of will, an individual will, because it always starts with me, and a collective will uh, among people of good faith who can begin to, to realize let me back up and just say, I don't know about you, Marvin, but my life, I feel very blessed. But the things that have defined me have been tragedies. I, I think this is the United States' biggest test right now, the very biggest test. And um, let, let me sort of balderize um, Churchill without breaking down and bawling, is that, you know, when they study our, uh, our American empire, I hope they'll say that this was our finest hour. That is to say that we met these kinds of insidious things. Could anything be darker than what was facing Britain in the spring and summer of 1940? I don't think so. And um, that didn't happen. And so let us among good people of all political persuasions vow to ourselves right here and now we will not let this experiment go. We will not be made prisoners of the people for whom division is another profit center. We will not have a foreign policy based on where I have a hotel or where I want to have a hotel. We will have a, 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 a politics of, of honesty in which we respect institutions and, no, and don't call it a deep state. A deep state just is, is a ridiculous notion. There's no deep state. There are only people of both political parties who are well-meaning about perpetuating the best of this republic. Are they bureaucrats? Yeah. Turns out bureaucrats get things done. They know how to deliver masks and PPE to places that this government doesn't have a clue about. So what does this government do? It abdicates it and says it's all about the states. Oh no, I, my poll numbers are down. It's not about the states. It's about me. I know how to take care of this. I mean, this is the failure. Ultimately it fails. And at the end of the day, the American people will be the judge we owe. Now, whether he abides by this or not, we don't know. No, Ken, let me, um... Let me for a moment play a game with you because we're aiming toward the end of this conversation. Um, 
Assume for a moment that you were teaching um, American History 101. You're a professor um, at a nice Midwestern college, and you believe that American history <clears throat> has not been taught well up to this point. And I'm wondering if you were to share that point of view, what are the areas in the teaching of American history that you would like to see corrected? Oh, what a great, great question, Marvin, as always. So, so listen, history, like almost everything else, goes through fashions, historiography, it's called, you know? And for the longest time, there was a narrative fashion. Just tell the stories of the great men, capital G, capital M, the top-down histories of presidential administrations punctuated by wars, and you have it. After the Second World War, when 60 million people were lost their lives over an endlessly another insane human endeavor, um, we started replacing it. First was a kind of Freudian interpretation, of course. Uh, then there was a Marxist economic determinist. There was symbolism, <laughs> there was semiotics, there was deconstruction. There's different sorts of modalities of how you approach history. The problem is, is that like a pendulum swinging to one extreme, it always threw out the other viewpoint. And what I would say is, no, we haven't taught history well. We have to listen to bottom-up voices all the time. We have to shut up and stop imposing a kind of white narrative of the United States. It's just never been that. And, uh, you know, be quiet and, and hear <laughs> bottom-up voices. At the same time, you can incorporate perspectives from each one of those uh, areas. And you can understand things seen through an Afrocentric lens or a queer studies lens or a deconstructed lens or a Freudian or whatever you wanna call it. But you have to have something bigger than it is. I went to Hampshire College. That's what they have taught us from the very beginning that you couldn't just see it from one narrow way in. There never was that. There was always many modes of inquiry. And when you pull your lens back and you see that, so let me tell you, students, and this would be the University of Michigan, I grew up in Ann Arbor, uh, a good Midwestern university. Um, let me tell you a history that is more complicated, but I would suggest more interesting and prepares you for the possibilities of improving on this rather than despairing of the kind of um, unmucked out stable we find ourselves in now. Ken, Ken, we have a minute left. You have delved into American history so deeply. Is there a place, is there an individual that you can cite now quickly for us who will leave us with a sense of hope and inspiration for the future of this country? Well, there are lots of people I've known, gotten to know. There's Lincoln, there's Jackie Robinson, there's Louis Armstrong, but let's just go with John Lewis right now. He's my man right now. He understood. And just remember when the rest of us are quarantined, literally and figuratively, he ran towards the problem, just as nurses and delivery men are doing right now. And that I would ask everybody within the sound of my voice to wonder whether you're part of the solution or part of the problem, whether you kind of pay lip service to this terrible situation that African-Americans have always found themselves in, or you're going to do something about it. And I'd rather Ken, be among the latter. Can we, I could talk to you forever, but I know you're a busy guy and the clock has its own tyranny and it's telling me that the time is up. So let me first thank all of you out there who have, tuned in in one way or another to this conversation with Ken Burns. But most important, I want to thank Ken Burns for sharing his vast knowledge and experience and insights into American history uh, with us, particularly to give us insights into this very difficult moment in American history for us all. We are grateful and maybe, maybe we will yet emerge from this year with a new look, perhaps, but with the fundamentals still very much in place. I certainly hope so. But that's it for now. I'm Marvin Calvin. As Ed Morrow used to say many years ago, good night and good luck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs>